Now, with a satellite galaxy, you're dealing with a lot less stars than you would be with something like the Milky Way, which means you have a lot less supernovas to populate it with heavier materials. Is there any way we can tell what the accretion disk, uh, what's in it? What's, what's it made of? Is it mostly just gas or is it possible that there's heavier materials there? So it, 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 it will be it will be interstellar matter. So it's a combination of gas and dust. But think about the Magellanic Clouds as a very different type of environment when compared to the Milky Way. And the difference really lies in the dust content. And when I say Magellanic Clouds, by the way, I mean, um, you know, this, this object was observed in a large Magellanic Cloud, but then there is also another satellite galaxy, which is a little further away than the large Magellanic Cloud, which is called the small Magellanic Cloud. <laughs> and you can see them beautifully both uh, from, from the Southern Hemisphere. If, if you get a chance to go there, they're um, visible to the naked eye and absolutely amazing, amazing to see. So the Magellanic Clouds have a lower dust content with respect to the Milky Way, and they also have a lower, what we call metal content. And if you have spoken to astronomers before, you will know that everything that is heavier than hydrogen and helium, we refer to as metals. <laughs> so, so the Magellanic clouds have a lower content of these, of these metals compared to the Milky Way. And the combination of this lower metallicity and lower dust content in the LMC, the large Magellanic cloud, is partly cause of us being able to detect the star um, in the first place. Because typically these massive stars that are still so young and still in the accretion phase are deeply embedded in their natal molecular cloud, so in, in the stuff that they're forming from, so to speak. So it's, it's really literally like a big amount of stuff that is hiding the massive star from our from our telescopes, from our optical telescopes. And that is certainly true for Milky Way objects. But in the Magellanic clouds, because of these different environmental conditions, we were able to, to detect the star in the optical. And we can go into this a little further if you want to. Yeah, how's that work? Well, so for example, the lower metallicity leads to the stars in the Magellanic clouds to be, again, compared to stars in, in the Milky Way of comparable mass, um, the stars there to be hotter, so to have higher photon fluxes. So they, they have stronger ionizing radiation. They also have slightly weaker stellar winds because of the, the, lower, the lower metallicity. And the combination of the stronger radiation and the lower dust content, which is really what gets momentum imparted onto it by the surrounding radiation field and, and the stellar winds, have made sure that the star has been exposed from this natal cocoon of interstellar matter on much faster time scales than what we would expect for a similar source in, in, in the Milky Way, so for a similar star in the Milky Way. And that's really a very lucky happenstance for us. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, hmm, I hadn't thought about that, that, I mean, even the stars themselves are, they vary on the size of the galaxy that they're in, <laughs> with, especially with metallicity. And, you, you know, you see this cloud with all low metallicity stars, but that can't be good for planets in, in small satellite galaxies, would it? Well, I'm hesitant because this is not entirely my research field, how planets form in, in protoplanetary disks. <laughs> but yes, there will be differences. And, and this is also why this particular object is so interesting, because really it now allows us to perform an empirical study of an accretion disk and a growing young star in these different environmental conditions. We do know that massive stars are continuously being formed in the Magellanic clouds, and we do know that as a consequence, there are accretion disks and jets. It's not like we don't know about those, but we have never actually observed, directly observed and resolved an accretion disk in an environment such as this one. And therefore, if you want a benchmark object that, for example, theorists or, or people running simulations of the formation of massive stars 
will want to use to understand how changing these types of parameters, like the metallicity and the dust content of the, the material the star is formed from, will have an impact on the evolutionary pathway of the star. Now, let's get into that. What is going to be the evolutionary pathway to the star? And I want to point out that this is not a system that's going to form planets. It doesn't have time, if it even has the material. So what does the future of this star look like, and how much longer is that accretion disk going to be there? So that is, again, a very good question, which we cannot fully answer with you know a number with the data that we have um, in hand at the moment. From the optical data that we have, so from the actual spectrum of the star, it does not look like the star is an O-type star. So the, the sort of hottest stars uh, and most massive stars that we, that we know of. It is more likely a B-type star. So it will live slightly longer than those more massive O-type stars. And we estimate the mass to be somewhere between 12 and 15 solar masses, depending on the method that you use to, to estimate the mass. But really, the fact that this is either an early type B star or a late type O star means that it will have a lifetime of up to a couple of you know mega years, so a couple of million years, which is a lot shorter than stars like our own sun, of course, which lives for you know orders of magnitude more than that. Um, and as a consequence, the, the accretion disk, just in terms of time scales, will likely not have the time to form to form any planets. But what, what is more than that, because the disk is surrounding a massive star that is outputting these enormous amounts of radiation, the disk will be literally evaporated before it can form any, any planets. So it's bad news for things that would want to co coagulate and form planets in that disk. Now, what about infrared? So is this disk detectable that way? In other words, is it you know radiating the heat it's absorbing from the star, or is it just too far away for that kind of a measurement? No, it is absolutely visible in the in the infrared. In fact, the first mass estimate that was that was done for the system was performed on Spitzer data in the infrared. Spitzer, of course, if you compare it to the James Webb Space Telescope, which is now on everybody's mind, has much lower spatial resolution. So really, these were all upper limits only that were that were obtainable. We are hoping that eventually the system HH. 1177 will be observed with the James Webb Space Telescope because we are expecting a lot of interesting emission lines coming from the star, the jet, and the accretion disk themselves. So in fact, in the near infrared with James Webb, we can observe all three of those components simultaneously, which would be hugely exciting. And with those three components, I really mean the disk, the star, and jet. And perhaps we can even start to address how that, that jet is being launched from the star itself. 